Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into the store either through the front door or through our website and give you guys about a two to four minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff that is out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is not to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. This is strictly being made for entertainment and educational purposes only. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, this video is brought to you by our new website, WeBuyGuns.com. If you are considering selling a firearm or firearms collection, please log on to our website and create an account. And then you can submit your firearms for an offer request. We will review those and within about 24 hours, send an offer back to you. Now those offers do come with a printable offer certificate, which you can take with you to competing gun stores to try and leverage yourself a better deal. If you're unable to get a better deal, go ahead and sell it to us. We do provide you with the shipping label and we do pay you with either a check or ACH direct deposit right to your bank account to make the process as seamless and easy as possible. So remember again, please go check me out at webuyguns.com. Remember the format of this video. We start with the most common and move through the least common as the video progresses. So starting us off with number one, we have a Ruger Super Blackhawk chambered in 44 Magnum. Of course, the brush stainless finish. Now the story with this would actually begin back in about 1979 when Ruger would implement the standard model Red Hawk. And that was really designed off of the configurations or at least the design details of the security line, the security six and whatnot, just really beefed up to handle a higher pressure cartridge. Now that was met with a lot of great success. It had traditional lines of a, of a revolver. It was just you know beefed up for a larger caliber. Now, about eh, just shy of 10 years later, in about 1986, Ruger would redesign the line with the intention of dropping the basic Red Hawk line and come out with this, the Super Red Hawk. Now, the Super Red Hawk was more of a design iteration inspired by the GP100 series that was really popular in the Ruger lineup at the time, or even the grip modules are interchangeable. The inner workings are pretty much all the same. Everything's just beefed up and scaled up uh, for this revolver. So it was really meant to be in a, a larger, higher pressure calibers, the 44 Magnum, then we're getting into the uh, the 460 Ruger, uh, 454 Casul. Uh, and I'm trying to think, uh, I know that they offered it in 10 millimeter as well. They had the Alaskan series, the really short barrel. This one here is in the seven and a half inch. And really one of the big things that you're gonna notice is they extended the frame, reinforcing the contact point where the barrel meets the frame itself. Again, just offering more rigidity. Now again, that they had planned to drop the original uh, Red Hawk line, but they never did. Of course, a lot of shooters still have preference for the Red Hawk over the Super Red Hawk, mainly because of the uh, sort of the, uh, again, the uh, general aesthetic of the firearm. So to a lot of people, uh, this just, just very unconventional with this reinforcement piece out here at the front of the frame. A lot of people like these, again, the traditional layout of a, of a uh, kind of more classic looking revolver and a lot of people still gravitate towards the Red Hawk line uh, when going for the 44 Magnum. Uh, anyway, on the market right now, these are selling used for about the six to $800 mark, depending on what it comes with. Uh, keep in mind too, these were, uh, one of the big differences is the Super Red Hawk was cut for rings, which this one has, whereas the basic Red Hawk was not. So again, a really nice hunting revolver uh, or just a target revolver. Just really cool overall nonetheless. Double single action, six round cylinder. But yeah, there it is, a Ruger Super Red Hawk. Okay, up next I have a really cool nine millimeter pistol that has made a splash in the consumer market over the past couple years. This is the Grand Power Strybog SP9A1 nine millimeter pistol. Now, Grand Power is actually a Slovakian company that was founded back in 2002, and their main interest was with defense contracting. They wanted to be a developer of service or military style pistols, uh, rifles, submachine guns, and to really reach those contracts. In fact, Grand Power did submit this to the United States Military Subcompact Weapons Program, the SCW program, a couple years ago. But many of you may remember that that was actually won by BNT with the APC 9K. Uh, this was actually a close contender for that. Now, one of the great things about this is, you know, not only are you getting nice, rugged quality, it's the price point. So. 
this has really made its its a prevalence or its name known on the U.S. consumer market in the past couple of years. And one of the big reasons for that is what you're paying to get it. So a couple years ago, uh, you could get these things brand new for maybe about the five to $600 mark. It's ticked up about $100 since, of course, with everything going on, I'm sure it has something to do with it. Plus, as any new firearm enters the market and gets popular, the price is gonna go up over time. They've come out with a couple of different variations of it as well. Um, but again, right now, and I, I've seen a couple websites that even have them in stock, you should be able to pick one up new for about the $700 mark. Uh, use, you should be in about, you know, for just the basic pistol without a, uh, a brace on it, uh, you should be in about the five to $600 mark uh, with a brace like this, maybe about $600. Now, speaking of brace, this does have a collapsing tail hook brace on it. Uh, of course, braces are intended to be used as braces, but it does give it sort of that PDW SMG type look, which is just really appealing to a lot of shooters. Now, if we're talking about the pistol caliber carbine market, it's really hard to get into something brand new for, you know, about the six to $700 mark. The only other thing I can think of is maybe the Ruger PC carbine. But if we're looking at like the, the uh, CZ Scorpions or, or the like MP5 clones that are out there, everything pretty quickly gets up over $1,000, especially when you add a brace and stuff like that to it. So to be, you know, with brace, ready to go, out of the box, brand new for under $1,000, uh, really, really cool product. Uh, I have not personally owned one, but speaking to people who have, people have really been blown away with the quality of the firearm. Um, yeah, there's like anything else, there's going to be different opinions on them, but for the money paid, people uh, seem to like them. So really, really cool, robust feeling, full metal upper receiver assembly, uh, metal barrel, of course, and bolt assembly. And then you have a polymer lower grip module and magazine well with a detachable stick magazine. And this one holds 30 rounds. I know they come with a 25 or 20 round capacity as well as I have one sitting over there. Um, just a really, really cool package and looks like they would be a ton of fun at the range. So anyway, uh, again, surprise, this is the first used one I've had in. I've had several new ones come in here through transfer, but uh, really, really cool to kind of get my hands. I want to be able to really take a closer look at it, but this is the Grand Power Strybok from Slovakia. Okay, up next is a really cool rifle and actually one that is brand new to the market. This is the Sig Sauer Cross. I'm gonna pull it out of the box, get it assembled and be right back with you. Okay, so here is the Sig Sauer Cross, a brand new rifle released in about 2009 is officially when these sent the market. So these have really only been out for about a year and a half and they are pretty difficult to find. Now this one actually came to us by way of a viewer on our website from Missouri. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. There is not really a whole lot of information to go over other than the specs. Uh, this was offered in three essential calibers, a uh, 308 6.5 Creedmoor, which is what this is, and 277 Fury. And the 277 and the 308 are offered in a 16 inch barrel, the 6.5 Creedmoor and an 18 inch barrel. And the really impressive thing about this is the weight. They do weigh in between about 6.5 and 6.8 pounds, which for a precision rifle is incredibly lightweight. If you consider competitors like the Ruger Precision Rifle, um, the Savage 110 Stealth, or the Asbury Precision, which are really bench rifles, but this is set up in a similar configuration, but it's so lightweight you could actually uh, pack this thing along with you if you're going, you know, hiking over a long distance, going hunting, anything like that. So it is actually really, really, really lightweight. Uh, it's surprising when you pick it up based on looking at it, you would expect it to be more in the 10 pound range like everything else of its class, but it's really not. So really cool in and about the weight of an AR-15. Does have a stock that does fold over to the side. What you need to do if you want to remove the bolt um, trying to think what else you do have an adjustable comb for your uh, for the elevation on your cheek as well as a uh, collapsing uh, butt pad here in the back so you can adjust the length of pull. You have an M lock free floated barrel here, an M lock rail uh, section stainless barrel that is threaded. So uh, uses AICS magazines, magazine releases right here, uh, bolt action. Um, not a whole lot really to say about it. Just a really, really cool package. Again, hard to get, desirable to get. And this is actually the first bolt action rifle uh, that's been released from SIG since about 1993. So this is really not their market that they typically are in, but they really came out with a cool option. Now, the price point on this is also a little bit hard to nail down because there's not a lot of sales uh, detail out there on the, on the market. The MSRP on this is at about $1,750. I am seeing them use go between that and even upwards of close to 2000 
Um, so take that for what you will. I'm sure the price is going to fluctuate as this did hit the market in the middle of a shortage. I'll be curious to see what it actually does when they are available and uh, easily uh, able to be purchased out on the market. Now, one other thing is shortly after release, they did notice a uh, defect in the trigger where, and I, and I want to say it was something about, you know, once you close the bolt, if it's, or putting it on safe can fire, it was some bad thing about the trigger. Uh, I'd have to look into exactly what the issues were, but they did issue a recall uh, on this. And I don't know if this particular one has been back to the recall. Maybe the previous owner can tell me that or not. I don't know. Uh, but, you, you know, SIG will handle that for free if you have one of these. Uh, it should be anything that's been purchased uh, as of late should have actually had that already addressed, kind of like the SIG P365. So uh, SIG does have a history of uh, early release issues with their firearms and recalls and stuff like that. So the recall on these is still active. So take a look at that if you have one or if you're looking to buy a used one. But anyway, really, really cool firearm nonetheless. Even if you go through the recall, it shouldn't cost anything, but maybe some time just to get it, get it taken care of. But just a really, really cool firearm. Um, Really happy to get this in so so soon after release, but really cool nonetheless. And thank you again to our viewer in Missouri. Okay, up next I have an interesting pistol from SIG that a lot of people have probably not heard of. This is the SIG Sauer P224. This one is chambered in 40 Smith & Wesson. Now, this would actually be released onto the market in 2012 as a double action only, and then 2013 as both a double single action, which is what this is. This is the Equinox, again chambered in 40. They chambered these as well in 9mm and 357 SIG. What this was intended to be was a very small subcompact version of the P226. So if you bring the barrel out about here and bring the bottom of the frame down about here, then you have a 226. Somewhere in between, you would have a P229. Now, the P229 was mainly probably one of the biggest reasons that this failed. The ergonomics on this were not great, so when people went to a compact variation of the 226, most people would settle on the 229, which predated the 224 anyway. So there was already a lot of uh, interest in the 229 on the market, as well as a lot of people uh, who had been talking up the pistol, a lot of prestige in the P229, uh, or the P228 as well, uh, earlier iterations of it. Uh, so the P224 was just not set up to really be successful. If you pick one up and handle it, it is not very ergonomic or comfortable in the hand. I have small hands. This really does not feel good to me. I imagine that this would probably feel awful to somebody who has really large hands with my pinky really falling off the bottom of the grip. You can, of course, get extensions and things like that, but the swell is hitting me in a really weird place in my hand. It is just not a comfortable feeling handgun. In 40, I imagine it's probably gonna be very snappy and not very comfortable to shoot. And that was typically the complaint that these had. So in 2016, they were discontinued from the SIG lineup, making this have only a production run of about three to four years. It makes them pretty un uncommon on the market, even though that they were not really inherently a very popular design. Of course, there is interest in them as they are no longer manufactured for collectors and people who like SIG pistols and things like that. Uh, this, again, is an Equinox. SIG is really well known for rebranding and repackaging their pistol lineups, whether it's an Equinox or a Stainless Elite or a Nitron or the Scorpion or something along those lines. So they change up the finish, the grips, the sights, and try and repackage the pistol in many different ways. The Equinox is known as a more premium uh, offering with the night sights, the kind of bitone finish. Uh, and these on the market right now in 40, probably between about seven and $800, maybe in the $700 mark. Uh, nine millimeters are gonna be a little bit more, uh, go up a little bit more in price. Uh, the base model, probably somewhere between five to six hundred dollars for the 40, maybe a little bit higher for a nine millimeter. So they're not overly expensive. And again, somebody interested in this is probably most interested in just rounding out a SIG pistol collection. As again, the just the ergonomics are not all there. But this is the first one I've ever had in here used. Again, not a very common pistol to find on the market. So if you do like them, they are a little bit tough to come by. Uh, there is a SIG P224 Equinox N40. Okay, up next, I have a really cool pistol also from Sig Sauer. This one comes to us from a viewer in North Carolina through our website. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is a Sig P230, specifically the SL chambered in 380 or nine millimeter Kurtz as marked on the firearm. It is a fixed barrel direct blowback, very similar in function and form to a Walther PPK. It's just probably what a lot of you are thinking right now if you're not too familiar with this. 
If we go back to Germany in the post-war period, post-World War II, a lot of police are carrying around PPs and PPKs chambered in 32 automatic. If you look at the philosophy of police forces prior to World War II and just post-World War II, it was not really believed that police would really have a necessity for carrying around a large amount of firepower with them. The idea of the modern, you know, Glock 17 with 17 rounds of 9mm or maybe a squad, you know, car uh, AR-15 or Remington 870 was really not the philosophy of police forces back then and there really wasn't a huge necessity for them. They needed something small, light, and easy to carry that was convenient to carry. It was more of a piece of the uniform, uh, really intended to be there as more of a deterrent from somebody doing something stupid as it was really not needed to get uh, police out of any type of dire situations as that just was not typical of the time. Now, as we all know, times change, and specifically in Germany in 1972, we had the Munich Olympics massacre, which really caused Germany to stop and rethink how it was going to arm its, you know, civil police, military forces, and things like that to better combat uh, issues like this. And then you start having the emergence of special police forces, um, you know, and this, this is really when the philosophy would start taking off around the world in big prominence throughout the 70s and 80s. So it was a big wake-up call, not only from Germany, but from around the world, you know, these terrorist actions and things like that. So they wanted to come up with a new sidearm for their police. Now, SIG would start developing this, and this is basically intended to be similar in form and feel, and also the philosophy of something easy and lightweight to carry, similar to the PP and PPK but was going to be chambered on a more potent cartridge, the 380. Now, this was also chambered in 32 automatic, but it was submitted to the German police as the 9mm Kurtz or the 380 automatic. Now, Germany would definitely decide that they would want to go with a 9mm instead, as that was gaining, again, more prominence and popularity around the world. So they would still go with a SIG product, the SIG P6, also, also the Walther P5, and the HK P7, the squeeze cocker, which I've had uh, on these videos before. Uh, the story with this was not quite over though. In about 1985, they would start getting imported into the United States as a commercial sidearm, and they would be sold as a commercial sidearm in other countries. And again, because there was popularity throughout the 80s, you know, the PPK, uh, and some things that are similar to it and in 380 automatic, it did have a lot of success here on the commercial market. It would be discontinued in 1996 and replaced by the P232 by SIG, and kind of the rest is history. Uh, but they are really, really cool, fun, ergonomic pistols, and they are a lot of fun to shoot. Now, on the commercial market, they are not overly expensive. You know, in their original box, maybe five to six hundred dollars, maybe up a little bit from there. This one's got some wear on it, uh, some light scratches and stuff in the finish, but they are not super expensive. Maybe a little less pricey than an actual Walther PPK, but still, they are a lot of fun to shoot, a lot of fun to own and collect, and again, something that's not manufactured anymore. But anyway, really happy to get that in. Also, thank you again to our viewer in North Carolina. That is a SIG P230. Okay, up next, I have a pretty interesting rifle that comes to us from Egypt. This is an 8mm Egyptian Hakim rifle, gas-operated, shoulder-fired, full rifle power cartridge in the 8mm Mauser. Now, if we look at the post-World War II period, a lot of countries are starting to transition away from their standard issue bolt-action rifles to something of a semi-automatic configuration. You saw this happening wartime with Germany with the K-43, the G-43, the United States with the M1 Garand, uh, you have uh, uh, Russia with the SVT-40, but most countries are moving through this same process in the 1950s post-war. You have FN, Belgium coming up with the FN-49 and the FAL, Germany with the G3, Spain with the Setme C, the United States with the M14, and of course you have uh, Sweden with the AG-42, later Egypt with the Hakim rifle. Now, in the early 1950s, Egypt wanted to transition away from the FN-49. I do not know why, because if you handle both, it is very clear to most people that the FN-49 is overall a better design. It is lighter, more wieldy, easier to carry, gentler shooting, and just overall uh, better manufactured. Maybe it was a cost issue, I am not 100% sure. So if you know the answer to that, please let me know down in the comment section. In the early 1950s, Egypt would actually solicit uh, Sweden to help them come up with a new battle rifle. Now, Sweden had just developed the AG-42, the Jungmann, which was, in principle, exactly the same as this rifle. There was no gas regulator. On the Hakim, you have a gas regulator here. You need a special tool to be able to, to uh, you know, change your gas settings. And it was chambered in 6.5 Swede, which is a much smaller, gentler shooting round. Uh, Egypt, having stockpiles of 8mm Mauser from their previously used FN-49 versions and their 8mm contract, as well as bolt-action 8mm Mauser, uh, Mausers, they wanted to keep 
uh, consistency with the ammunition. So they wanted this an eight millimeter Mauser, which is not as pleasant to shoot as it is in 6.5 Swede, and nor is it as pleasant to shoot as an FN49 chambered an eight millimeter Mauser. One of the biggest hindrances of this was the way that the action actually worked. You did have a 10 round detachable box magazine, but it was not really intended to be detached. You would actually load this generally with stripper clips in through the top. The way that you would load this is you would set the firearm onto safe, bring the top cover forward over the bolt, bring the whole thing to the rear, and it would lock open like that. You would then load your 10 rounds of ammunition on stripper clips down into the magazine. Now, when you're ready to fire, you would bring the firearm off of safe by switching the safety lever on the back over. That would kick the receiver, or I'm sorry, the top cover and bolt assembly forward of the rear of the receiver just slightly. You grab it and then bring it back. That'll allow the bolt to slam home, chambering your first round and allowing you to fire. Um, that's good in theory, I guess, but there's a lot of manipulation here required, especially if you are under stress and being shot at. Imagine having to remember gun on safe, top cover over, bolt back, load the firearm gun off safe, bring back, and then back to firing. Most people like to just have it locked open. You replace your magazine or pop in a stripper clip and then pull the charging handle back and let it go, having to manipulate the safety and everything. If you don't, and you leave it off safe, you come all the way back, once it hits the back of the receiver, it's gonna send it back uh, home. Or if you let it sit almost to the back and it doesn't, and your mind is thinking, hey, it's on safe and it's not gonna close, and I go to push those in and I knock this while I'm pushing in my ammunition, and force it closed, that's gonna catch my thumb, and that's gonna be really, really painful. And I've heard from people a lot worse than Duran thumb. So uh, definitely not the best mechanics in my opinion. Uh, so uh, it definitely makes for an interesting surplus rifle, something a little bit different and, and interesting to collect and use, but from a practical standpoint, not the best. If we look at the market on these, these have steadily been climbing over the past several years. Um, Lately, I've seen them mainly hover around the seven to $800 mark. Now, several of these did come in from Ethiopia and were sold as surplus through places like Classic Firearms and, and other importers for about the $1,000 mark and people were paying it. So I have to include that when we're looking at the value of these things. So uh, I would venture a guess to say based on condition, uh, 700 to $1,000 is about where these are going right now. Typically, I I've been used for a long time to see these for about $600 at gun shows, maybe $650, but they're definitely, like everything else, climbing way up there in value over the past couple years. So there it is, a 8mm Egyptian Hakim. Okay, up next I have a couple M1 carbines. I love it when these things come in, and I know I've talked about them in the past on these videos before. The history with these would actually start back in about 1937 when John C. Guerin would be working with Springfield Arsenal to come up with the eventual adaptation or adoption of the M1 Garand, or M1 Garand, I say M1 Garand, uh, rifle for service. Now, even though the United States was not at the time involved in the Second World War, some limited numbers of the M1 Garands would start getting issued out in about 1938, including to rear echelon personnel. Now, this would include cooks, mechanics, vehicle drivers, uh, communications technicians, things of that nature who did not have a primary responsibility of carrying around and shooting a rifle. Now, at the time, it was mainly uh, more common to find rear echelon personnel being issued with a, with a sidearm like a 1911 pistol or a 1917 service revolver. However, during the 1930s, the United States is observing Germany is showing a lot of aggression towards other uh, European countries, including Poland, and they are using uh, this very prominent Blitzkrieg type type tactic where they would use rush tactics or use airborne elements to drop in behind enemy lines to overwhelm and overtake the enemy. Now, observing this, the, uh, the United States decided that not only did it want a more usable and more serviceable and more ergonomic sort of PDW personal defense weapon for rear echelon personnel, it needed to be a little bit more viable as a combat rifle, uh, something that could be used to hold back the enemy should the rear line become the front line. That was why they wanted to come up with more of a carbine concept instead of just issuing out handguns, which was more customary in previous conflicts like World War I. In 1940, the United States uh, Ordnance Department would decide that it would want to go ahead and put out a solicitation for a new carbine design for the U.S. military. Now, most eyes from the Ordnance Department were on Winchester. Winchester at the time was actually working on developing a revised ver version of the M1 Garand or a new primary battle rifle. And that was actually being spearheaded by John, uh, by John Browning, not the John Browning, but his brother, John Browning. Now, when John Browning would pass away, uh, that would actually sort of lead Winchester to scrap this new battle rifle design plus. 
uh, you know, we've had two to three years of service with the M1 Garand. Other competitors have come along like the Johnson 1941 who had failed to replace it as well. So Winchester decided to scrap all investments and in working on this new project and take up this new solicitation for a carbine. Now at the time, there's a gentleman by the name of Dave Williams, also known to many as Carbine Williams, who was serving time in the United States Corrections uh, you know, infrastructure, and he was in prison. And during his time there, he had actually been working on coming up with a new gas operating system known as the short, uh, short stroke gas piston and working on revising that. Now the M1 Garand functioned on a long stroke gas piston, so you had a full length gas piston rod, which is really hard to condense down into a carbine package like this. On a short stroke gas piston, however, it's easier to put into a carbine. So after his stint in the corrections facility was over, Winchester would adopt him to come on board and start implementing this new design into a carbine package. And essentially what they would come up with is the M1 carbine. And by about 19, late 1940, early 1941, they would be adopted and production would begin. Now, the other interesting element of the M1 carbine is American industry ingenuity during a wartime sort of production. So of the M1 carbine manufacturers, Winchester was actually the only firearms manufacturer and there were about nine or 10 manufacturers of the M1 carbine. You had uh, Quality Hardware, National Postal Meter, uh, IBM, Rockola who made jukeboxes, Inland Division of General Motors, uh, Erwin Peterson, uh, trying to think Saginaw, Underwood. So there is a lot of manufacturers of these and typically a lot of them would make, not be tooled up for every single part, but a lot of them would make many of the components and they would be shipped to one another. So that's typically why you find a lot of subcontractor parts on different rifles. If you find a correct M1 carbine with all of a certain manufacturer's parts, that was not too common as most of them did not make all of the parts. Um, so anyway, just kind of a little interesting tidbit of information. Now, if we looked at it from a collector standpoint as well, this on these you exhibit early uh, production elements like this has a flip site, which should be correct for this time period. But a post-war, late 1945-46, when they would adopt the Type 3 barrel band with the bayonet lug. This would have a Type 2 or Type 3 rear sight, so an adjustable sight with an aperture here at the back, uh, which can be changed for elevation and windage, not a flip sight anymore. And again, the Type 3 uh, bayonet lug. World War II, it would not have a bayonet lug on it, so it's kind of how you can tell the differences there. Uh, this one here is actually an IBM in a post-war Ivor Johnson stock. Stock is not original World War II. Obviously, it is a post-war commercial. Ivor Johnson, Universal, there were a couple manufacturers of M1 carbines. They sourced surplus parts, sold them to the commercial and the police markets in the 60s and 70s. Um, this one here is a quality hardware. No, I'm sorry, it's National Postal Meter. Uh, here with some of the later elements, and this would be a wartime stock with a two-rivet handguard. Uh, pretty typical. So... Very interesting, both of these came from the same sour. We actually had four of them and now we're down to two. Uh, so really, really cool firearms. Um, nonetheless, market on these is all over the place, okay? When it comes to this stuff, it's parts originality. If it's got, you know, the World War II era parts or the post-war parts or a post-war stock, you know, the actual GI stocks only are about 100 to $150. Uh, these stocks sell for about 80, so you could easily, you know, replace it back to an original military stock. And it is an IBM uh, receiver with a World War II uh, site on it. So it's just really hard to nail down the pricing on this stuff. But typically, if you get like a shooter grade M1 carbine, uh, as long as it's a wartime manufacturer, you might start at about 800. Um, and then the price goes away up from there till you know, two, three, four thousand dollars depending on, you know, the manufacturer and the originality of the parts. Like an Erwin Peterson, you know, might go for about four to five thousand. So very, very cool nonetheless. I definitely really, really enjoy these. I have a couple myself. Uh, 30 carbine is just a real joy to shoot and just an interesting uh, piece of American history. So anyway, there is those, a couple M1 carbines. All right, last but not least is a really cool shotgun that comes to us from a viewer in Maryland. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is a Benelli M2. And the M2 is part of Benelli's Super 90 series of shotguns, the M1 through the M4. M4, their most recent iteration, which has been popularized by the United States military, other military and law enforcement forces around the world, video games, movies, and most notably has that sort of retractable, uh, adjustable stock here in the back. 
Now, the M2, of course, as the name would dictate, was an updated version of the M1. It uses the popular inertia uh, actuating system, which was developed in the 1980s, still used again today on their most uh, recent iterations, the M4. The M3 is just a hybrid pump to some automatic variation as well. Uh, this is really intended to be marketed towards law enforcement and militaries. They are known for being super reliable and super robust shotguns, which will definitely eat a wide variety of different ammunition types. Very, very popular on the market, of course, there are sporting use and variations of these as well. When it comes to price point, the M series, uh, the M1 through the M4, are definitely getting up there in terms of value, especially right now. Uh, typically right now on the used market, you might be in about the 1500 plus range, uh, depending on the condition, what it's got, and that sort of thing, original box and, and whatnot. So still a really, really cool, very desirable shotgun. This one is in excellent, very lightly used condition. So really happy to get that in. Not really much else to say about these. Uh, just happy to sort of share that with you guys here on the videos. That is the Benelli M2. And again, thank you to our viewer in Maryland for sending this one along to us. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel so you can see these videos as we do post them every single week. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.